Ah, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have got such an exciting program for you here today. Incredible. Oi. Jasper, <laughs> Jasper, very good. You know, one of the things that music matters, digital matters, social media matters, and branded pride themselves on is bringing the smartest, most interesting, and uh, the best thought leaders in terms of entertainment, cross-media, and content to this event. And this morning, for our opening keynote, we have somebody who is really special, one of the uh, smartest and broadest thinkers in the music business. Would you please give a very, very warm Singapore welcome to the chairman and CEO of Universal Music International, Mr. Max Hall. Max. everybody. I've had to rewrite my speech and take all the swear words out since um, Jasper's speech. Um, it's great to be here in Singapore at Music Matters. Uh, Jasper, thank you for inviting me. Uh, thanks to Janice Ko. Um, it's great to have the Singapore government uh, supporting music. Um, I've been in the music business um, a very long time. Uh, to date me in music terms, the first single I ever bought was A Voice in the Wilderness by Cliff Richard. Now, in my defense, I was only nine at the time, and Cliff was actually quite cool in those days. Uh, the first album I ever bought was The Beatles' Please Please Me in 1963, and that kind of started me on the romance of ending up in the music business. I've also been visiting Asia for a very long time. Um, my first visit east was to Tokyo in 1979. And like loads of people before me, I was blown away by the futuristic skyline of Tokyo, which was all there in the 70s. But it was even more baffling and exciting in those days than now, because literally to us young gaijin, there were no street signs in English or in Ma or Romaji as there are now. I was struck by the tremendous courtesy and efficiency of the Japanese touring business, Udo Artis. Uh, it was such that, as a manager, I was pretty redundant. Um, the group I managed were called Camel. They were a progressive uh, rock act from the era of long guitar and drum solos. And Camel's audience in Europe and the US was almost exclusively long-haired, scruffy, smelly, and slightly spotty guys. So joy of joys, when we arrived in Japan, we found our audience for Camel were largely girls. And they were pretty young girls at that. So, so we had a wonderful time, and um, I, I, I've loved Japan um, ever since. Um, <laughs> Um, here today in, in Singapore, I find myself more energized about both music and matters um, than I've been for some time. We're in the middle of a tremendously exciting transition, and it's great to be a part of it. Universal Music's strength is built on a bedrock of A&R and local music. Our Anglo language international music from America and the UK is incredibly important, but it's that balance with our local music that gives us our strength. Understandably at the moment, and particularly here at, at Music Matters, there is much talk and activity in Asia about telcos, tech companies, music platforms, and brands. But I sometimes fear they were a little bit in danger of forgetting about the basic building block of local music. I'm not talking so much about Japan or South Korea where investment in music is pretty high, but more about countries like Indonesia and China. 
Um, I'll focus on China a little later, but look at what an opportunity Indonesia is. Indonesia should be a great market for our businesses. 285 million active mobile phone subscriptions. Not bad for a country of 246 million people. I've often wondered why men need two private mobile phone numbers, but <laughs> maybe I'm being naive. Um, 75 million people online. Jakarta is the source of one in 50 tweets worldwide. And Indonesia is the number four Facebook market in the world with 50 million active users. But in fact, Indonesia is very troubled and has suffered two full storms in recent times. The first was the boom in ringback tones that three years ago boomed and then collapsed because of overreach by the telcos. The second, bizarrely, was inspired by KFC. Yes, Kentucky Fried Chicken, who launched an in-store physical albums promotion that despite very large volumes was a very unprofitable exercise and pretty much finished off the physical business in Indonesia and further undermined the value of music in the eyes of the consumer. A few years on, the industry is recovering against a background of growing economy and higher incomes. Um, but valuable lessons need to be learned from what happened in Indonesia, and this, uh, this um, uh, it goes across the region. Number one, respect the consumer. And number two, don't put short-term revenue gain in front of long-term business development. A number of new services are now entering the market, so we're optimistic about its digital future. Indonesian culture is famous from Bali to Java, all around the world. It's time that they had a music industry to match. We are determined at Universal to help our local artists build a business they can be proud of. In the last 50 years, the recorded music business has made most of its money, shall we say 80% of its money, in about 10 countries. And I believe that this is something that's going to change in the next 10, uh, 20 years. And part of our challenge is to even out uh, that income balance and revenue balance around the world. Um, an 80-10 split is bad for business, it's bad for artists, it's bad for fans. Indonesia is a key market in that transition, but there are others too. Um, it's encouraging for the first time to see Universal Music's artists getting royalty statements from countries like Cambodia and Vietnam, simply because iTunes launched in those markets. Um, it, it's just the beginning. But if you like, the really massive opportunities are in India and in China, and I'd like to spend a few minutes today talking about China. When I look at the Chinese music industry, despite its difficult past, I see the future. China is not only the world's largest country, it's also the world's biggest experiment in testing the new music business models of the future. The Chinese have virtually bypassed the business model that we came to rely on so effectively in the West and Japan over the last 50 years. The traditional model of purchasing musical product be it physical or digital, has never really existed in China on any major scale. The market is going straight to one where it's all about securing access to tracks. We face a choice to resist or embrace this change. Well, I'm a hugger, so I think we need to embrace. Chinese consumers are not that unusual. They are, in fact, increasingly becoming the norm. 300 million of them used mobile music services in 2013. 300 million. That's roughly the population of the United States. 
There is potential for our industry to create an ecosystem of paying consumers that could one day number a billion fans. Yet, our business collectively, even with this massive consumption of music, generated only 83 million US dollars at trade level last year. As an industry, we make more money in New York State than we do in the whole of China. Now, I love Manhattan, but boy, is that a wake-up call for us. Of course, piracy is largely to blame, but let's not use this as an excuse to hide behind wider issues of revenue sharing, limited licensing, problems with pricing, and, w and um, a narrow approach to A&R. I'm not saying that these failings are all down to us, but we have a responsibility to fix them. Despite the dramatic pace of change which the industry is undergoing in China, with new platforms coming and going, we should remember there are some things that remain constant. Those 300 million consumers are going to be joined by many more in the years to come. What unites them is their demand for great music, delivered on platforms of their choosing, made available when they want it, and when they do pay, paying a pay fair price for it. At Universal, our strategy is simple. Investing more in strong local repertoire from artists in Greater China has to be the basis for future growth. To do this, we need to understand the market better. We need to support talented musicians, promoters, technicians, and producers. We need to back new services. Ultimately, we need to have an approach which is wider than just betting on particular artists, but backing the music ecosystem as a whole. This means tackling a system for distributing music, which whilst it's not completely broken, is far from perfect. We need to build on the original Baidu deal and extend our approach to ensure that partners like Tencent, Alibaba, and CMC all become substantial business partners for both the international majors and local labels. They can help us protect our copyrights. We should work with them, not just in China, but help them expand all over the world. If a Swedish digital music service can take the world by storm, there's no reason why Chinese equivalents can't follow. If Alibaba's value is thought to be greater than Facebook, then anything is possible. We also have ambitious plans to grow our artist management platform, both expand and take a bigger share of the growing live market, secure new sponsorship deals, and continue to develop in video, karaoke, and more. Further, we have a big role to play in supporting Chinese artists export their creativity across the globe. We can learn here from the film studios who've struck smart deals with their Chinese counterparts to secure for Hollywood better protection of their rights in return for drawing on Chinese talent and production skills. Also, as a business, we sit on the greatest library of music ever produced, from the Beatles to Beethoven. Our classical repertoire, for example, allows people to listen to beautiful pieces written nearly 300 years ago to be heard in the salons of Vienna and Salzburg, which can still be enjoyed in an apartment in Qingdao or Chengdu today. The value of this is massive. If Chinese music is to go global and we're all to win, there are three basic lessons. We have to work together to secure the support that we need from business partners, regulators, and government. We cannot make short-term deals which secure jam today and store up problems tomorrow. And we have to remember that if we deliver good Chinese music in an environment where it can be bought easily, cheaply, and legally, then we will all prosper. This is our own billion people challenge. If we touch all of these consumers just once a year in some form, then we will all generate more renminbi to reinvest in China 
and build our businesses. At that point, China will eclipse Manhattan and no one will be happier than me. Finally, I'd like to stop talking about the future and turn more to the present. The value of the recorded music business in Asia is around 3.5 billion US dollars. And 3 billion of that is in Japan. So like a good music man, I'd like to follow the money and talk for a few minutes about Japan, the second biggest market in the world. There was a very good piece in the Wall Street Journal recently about the Japanese music decline in 2013 that described it as being in free fall. I don't propose to repeat the numbers, you've all seen them. The Japanese market is in a difficult phase of transition. But in 2013, the recorded music business grew in Europe and it grew in the US. But in Asia, it plummeted, fueled by Japan. Japan is unique and remarkable in many ways. It's an 80% physical business, probably still the most traditional in the world. It's 85% Japanese language market. It's the only country in the world that still has retail price maintenance. Official market share statistics are based on the amount of products manufactured. There is no official chart combining physical and digital. Large artist management companies represented by organizations like Onjikyo are extremely influential and they often own 50% of the master rights of recording with the record companies. The three majors, Avex, Sony and Universal, are less than half the business. The rest is made up by a multitude of indies. So all this adds up to, in a consensual society, it's very difficult to build consensus in Japan. But Japan has been an incredibly innovative and ahead of the curve market historically. Look at the 360 degree concept invented in Japan. After World War II, a young bass player called Shin Watanabe formed a band. And he traveled around Japan entertaining American troops and personnel who all were living there at the time. Traveling in Japan was a slow business, so he had quite a lot of time to think, and he decided to start a talent agency. He signed singers, songwriters, and musicians, and guaranteed them a monthly salary. He grew the business by diversifying from a booking agent to artist management, record production, and music publishing. Watanabe's business expanded and prospered, and he built a model for the 360-degree production companies that still 50 or 60 years later dominate the landscape in Japan. It was his idea that only in the last few years has been the West's answer to declining recorded music revenue. Sticking with Japanese innovation, in 2005, Rekachoku, the aggregating mobile music platform, was the poster child of the digital music business. There was consensus between larger record companies. Everyone worked and pulled in the same direction. And Record Choku exploded from 2005 to 2009, delivering music to the consumer's feature phones. The historians amongst you will know that Japan was closed to the outside world from 1600 until the Meiji Restoration in 1868. And there are still some echoes of this today. Feature phones were a Japanese invention and regarded as superior handsets. The entire business, both in telcos and music, totally underestimated the explosion of smartphones in the rest of the world. Sure enough, the feature phone's popularity dwindled and Rekachoku crashed. The physical business, as everywhere in the world, continued to decline and an understandable but protectionist attitude to high-priced physical goods saw rights owners refuse to license services like iTunes until only 18 months ago. 
iTunes was the only bright spot in the Japanese music business in 2013 as it started to flourish with finally all the music available. This protectionist attitude has also prevented any viable subscription services from launching or being viable. Japan is a country with digital savvy, law-abiding and high disposable income consumers. It also has high internet penetration and a strong Wi-Fi 4G environment. It has every reason to become a leader in the music business again. I call upon the spirit of Shin Watanabe to lead us all back to prosperity. We need to break the deadlock over day and date releases on subscription services, do away with holdbacks. We need to price our music in an appropriate way for subscription. We need to encourage good and credible services on Android, actively work towards a combined chart, plan for the future of digital radio services, embrace video, and above all, listen to what the consumer wants. And of course, as always, boost A&R investment. A healthy Japan means a healthy global record business. It is imperative that we all work together, record companies, artist management, and music platforms to revitalize the business there. Thinking back to those days in 1979 when I was touring around Tokyo, Nagoya, and Osaka, I wasn't just drinking sake, eating teppanyaki, and chasing girls. I was also learning about the music business. And little did I know that the explosion of the CD was just around the corner. 35 years later, I was in Japan again earlier this week, and I'm still learning about the music business. But this time, I can foresee the explosion as we transform into the new world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Max. Max, come and have a seat. Uh, very uh, stimulating, provocative thinking that uh, you brought to bear. Uh, that um, just interesting to hear your observations after many, many years. And a couple of questions I thought might be interesting for the audience and for yourself. I'm fascinated that you evolved from being an artist manager and being an A and R centric uh, UK executive into international. How did that? How did that come about? How did you glide into the? whole world of international, which is the biggest revenue producing element of Universal, the largest uh, music company in the world? Well, um, yeah, I, I, in, I've, I've sort of had three careers, and the, and the first one was artist manager, uh, I had delusions of being a record producer, um, uh, I, you know, I've toured all around the world, and in fact, actually, funnily enough, when I was a record producer, uh, many, many years ago, working with an artist called Michael Chapman, who was signed to Harvest. Um, I was recording at John Congas's studio, who was a South African singer-songwriter that you will remember. And um, I needed some backing singers. And he said, I know some backing singers. And up appeared Mutt and Stevie Langer. Mutt Langer, that's the producer of uh, Shania Twain. Def Leppard, Brian Adams, etc. Absolutely, and the extraordinary thing about it was, I remember asking him because he was a brilliant backing singer. I remember asking brilliant. him, um, "So, w w where did you come from?" He said, "Well, actually, I'm a record producer, and of course, the rest is history." He only became probably the greatest record producer there ever was, and that's actually how I met you, Ralph. In fact, at, at, your, at your office in Roland Gardens, I think, in South Kensington. Anyway, one day, I was minding my own business, doing running labels. I had a little label called Criminal Records, the label you can't trust. <laughs> and um, That's good. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and managing artists. And one day I was asked to a meeting at Warner Brothers Records. Uh, I thought it was about an artist that I was involved with called The Inmates. And they offered me a job as an A&R man. And um, uh, I, I then transitioned into the record business. So you always had the reputation of not being an um and r man, um, ah, uh, not really knowing what decision to make. You were very, very definitive about signing talent, developing talent, growing talent. And hearing what you'd said in your keynote, I was taken by the optimism that you're seeing across Asia. 
And in fact, um, uh, I'm also interested in the way that Universal find global priority acts from this region. One in particular is from Malaysia, uh, an artist called Yana, Y-U-N-N-A. Um, is this part of a, a wider thinking within the company to really seek out emerging talent from the region and putting it into the global machinery such that you can develop and grow artists from this part of the world on a global basis? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I joined Universal 15 years ago and, and sort of went into the, uh, the international world and got more pages in my passport. And, and it's been a fantastic experience traveling all around the world and, and discovering music of all shapes, sizes, and forms. Right. Um, and I've always operated on the basis that I, I don't mind where the music comes from as long as it's great music. Yeah. And through that time, we've had tremendous success with, with people from all around the globe. Um, Juanes, I always remember from Colombia, was an ex extraordinary experience for us all. And then we have a Chinese artist called Sa Ding Ding who, who's toured all around and she won the uh, BBC uh, Music Award. Um, this year, Lord has played on the global stage, um, uh, a, a massive success um, from our company in New Zealand. And um, uh, my assistant here <laughs> is uh, promoting her greatly. Wonderful artist, yeah. great artist. True. And, and you know, I've always kind of had a dream that I, you know, I'd love to see an artist from China or from Japan succeed in the West. And I, I think you know, it, 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 it's happening because the wonderful thing about the internet is it, it breaks down the barriers. The, um, the gatekeepers of traditional media become less powerful, and um, it's possible for music to start making waves in one place and be everywhere uh, in no time at all. So it's something we're very focused on. We have a team of people in London whose job it is to pick artists from all around the world, and particularly in Asia, and see if we can uh, uh, um, expose them elsewhere. Now, some of the optimism that you were voicing also focused on some of the new ways in which the business is changing and new trends are emerging and new media where music gets sold. And uh, one of the countries that I thought would be interesting to just look at is in the Philippines, obviously a big country, 100 million people with a very big diaspora around the world that fuels interest in, in music and what happens in that particular market. And there's been an amazing turnaround uh, of uh, Universal's company in the Philippines uh, with uh, really triggered by this uh, very interesting deal that uh, Sandy Montero, who runs your ASEAN countries, did with Smart, the big mobile company in the Philippines. Any, uh, any comments on that? Well, the, you know, the, the, again, the music business, as you say, it's changed dramatically. We're, we're now in a sort of portfolio business. We sell physical goods, and physical goods are are still doing quite well, particularly in the deluxe part of the market. Right. We sell digital downloads. We're in the streaming of subscription revolution, which is very, very exciting at the moment. But then it the other thing that's come in in the last five or six years is, is using music to help other people sell their products. Uh, and um, this all, for, I think it kind of started for us in in France, where our French company once did a deal with a bank, where banks try to attract students. Um, students normally open a bank account with their first money when they go to university. They normally stay with the same bank for the rest of their lives. So Societe Generale and our company schemed up that if you opened an account with Societe Generale, you got a access to a music service that Universal would give you music, information, photographs, tickets, etc. And this sort of fueled into building a whole um, new business development team. And our new business development team in Asia, with Sa uh, Sandy's team, um, have done a similar deal with the telco in the Philippines, where uh, the telco is trying to attract subscribers. And music is a very, very attractive prospect to the subscribers they're trying to attract. And it's, it's pretty much doubled our business in the Philippines. So that's another good sign to show that the business is not in a kind of apocalyptic uh, f fall at all. In fact, if you find these new ways of developing music and touching your consumers, and the ways that the consumers touch their music, then clearly there will be potential, assuming of course, that you can make the music legally acquired by the, by the consumer. 
Yeah, I, I, th I think, you know, we, we've, I think we've spent too much time in the past complaining about consumer behavior. That's a good point. And I think now what we, we've arrived at some time ago, happily, is that we've got to embrace the consumer and support what it is the consumer wants. And I think what we're showing is the, the legitimate music business can recover and is recovering if you offer the consumer an array of options of music services at different price points, doing different things, um, you will gradually migrate them from crap services that perhaps are illegal and clunky and, and, and not a very good experience. And then you, you can see we've got, we've got um, laboratories, and those laboratories are places like Sweden and Norway, where the future has arrived. And, 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 and the markets are growing, um, revenue levels are back to what they were in 2004, and um, they're, uh, they're the mirror image of what I was talking about in Japan. Japan is 80% physical, Sweden is nearly 80% digital, and it's a streaming and subscription world and, and doing wonderfully well. Well, I'm pleased that you raised that issue about Japan, because um, in particularly in terms of streaming, there seems to be a lack of subscription services in Japan. So how important will these services be in the future for growth in Japan? And when do you think that we'll see more players in the subscription and streaming market entering in, in Japan? Well, I think um, the only good thing about having a catastrophe, as they had in 2017, is it's really shaken everybody up. 2017 Sorry. and 2013? Uh, 2013. Right. Um, uh, it, it was a 17% drop. drop. So a catastrophe like that in the second biggest market of the world, um, which is felt everywhere, I, I think has really, really woken everybody up. Right. And there's a lot of debate. I've had a lot of very interesting meetings uh, these past few days with a number of other labels and with uh, uh, business partners generally. And I think there's a real will to get something to happen. But it's very, very hard because you've got um, quite a conservative establishment in Japan that is protecting this very high-priced physical model. But you can't defy gravity, and it is coming, and the consumer is already showing um, what they want, and they want <laughs> access, they want portability, uh, and, and in Japan, I believe that will come. But there's, there's quite a few hurdles to go over in Japan, as I listed, so I won't repeat them. Well, it's so interesting, because if you look at the history of the way that mobile and mobile music developed, it was really Docomo in Japan that set the tone for all of that, going back almost 20 years. So obviously there are some optimistic threads within some of the localized gloom, and certainly some interesting new acts that are coming through the process as well. There's always great music in Japan, so I mean, I, you know, I, I, I love going there for, for, for um, it's so different, you know, the, the, the music is so extraordinary, and the television programs are so extraordinary. Um, it, it's a wonderful, vibrant place, um, but the, the consumer is already telling us that they want um, streaming and subscription, so we have to give it to them and, and take some chances. What you'd mentioned about Sweden and looking at the importance of streaming, Spotify, for example, and I think that uh, Universal has an interest in uh, Spotify or likes to look at a getting some kind of interest in these streaming companies. Do we? Um, th I've read that in one of the <laughs> trades, but I might don't be wrong. Don't believe what you read in the papers. Th that right. is true. I don't, won't believe yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but uh, something that uh, has been on quite a lot of people's minds here at this Music Matters this year is uh, this announcement that uh, uh, Beats, this uh, music service, streaming service, uh, might be acquired by Apple, and uh, do you think something like that will radiate uh, into Asia, uh, particularly with uh, iTunes being prominent in certain markets? Um, any any comments on this Beats uh, Apple thing? Well, I, you know, I won't comment on the specific Beats Apple deal, but but I I think the thing that's really exciting is that in the past, a lot of the tech giants were not very respectful. Music. Of music. Right. I'm being understated. We were raped <laughs> and pillaged. Um, <laughs> but, but, but now the competition for eyeballs for their services. And attention. And attention is, is really t is game changing. So, so you've, you've now got real competition between all the tech giants. And they're very interested in us 
as owners of music. And it's interesting, I, I, t I talked about China in, in, in my speech earlier. I spent years trying to get something going in China. Um, a lot of trips there, a lot of interminable 18 course dinners that never <laughs> seemed to come to anything. Um, and, and if you like, we were always calling China. China was never calling us. But boy, has that changed in the last few months that suddenly China is calling us. And everyone's reaching out to us, uh, all, all, all of the major internet service providers and the big companies, they all want to talk to us. Do you think that's partly because uh, three years ago, when the Chinese government developed their next uh, five-year economic plan, they put the creative industries, music, television, film, design, fashion, uh, as a major economic pillar. Do you think that that uh, has changed? Because you're off to China after your weekend in uh, Sydney, where you're going for some R&R and some good Australian music. Um, and uh, do you think that... Uh, uh, this uh, technology and media forum that you're going to be attending in China uh, will include members of the Chinese government uh, supporting what you've just said about them being much more aware of the importance of reaching out and making the creative industries and music from China more significant globally. Yeah, I, I think there's a, there's a sea change. I think that um, culture and the creative industries are, have gone up the agenda w with the Chinese government. But, but, I, but I also think Again, we we have to the creative businesses. I, I, I think we've largely all, all we've done is moan, right? With some justification, we were moaning. But I think what we have to do is we have to recognise that the key to this is really investing in China, right? And I think that a, a, a lot of us we we think China includes Taiwan. Well, to China, Taiwan is nearly as foreign as, as you and I. And, and I think the, the real emphasis needs to be on Chinese music, Chinese artists, Chinese recording engineers, Chinese producers, and, and we can really help bring skills to Chinese musicians and technicians. And I also think we need to train more Chinese music executives. Because again, if you look at Great most idea. of the majors, most of the majors have very talented people in their companies, but a lot of them are from Hong Kong and from Taiwan. We need them to be from Chengdu and from Qingdao and from Beijing. So when uh, you saw the explosion of Chinese movies starting to break internationally, which clearly helped the creative movement from China outwards, are you saying that there's potential in the different uh, 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 provinces of China to be able to find indigenous music that does have international appeal? and appeal that can bridge not just the Asia and ASEAN countries, but generally you might find, say, the next great uh, band, uh, artist coming from uh, Hunan, Sichuan, places like that? Yeah, you know, if you've got 1.4 billion people, there right. has to be some incredible artists and creativity there that, right. that, that need help and expertise. But it's funny, you mentioned the thing that I'm going to... Uh, to Qingdao for this government technology forum. technology forum. And in the setup meeting that was in London a few months ago, um, Michael Wilson was there who runs Eon Films, the production right. company that produces James Bond films. And in the setup meeting, uh, he, was, he was great because he, he brought up the fact that he loves going to China and he always has a wonderful time and he meets everybody and they all say how much they love the James Bond films. And he always says, well, that's funny, because none of them are actually released in China. <laughs> <laughs> How interesting. Um, so we have a long way to go, but, but I think the film business is, is in some way leading the ways, because they've recognized that, that there, you know, there, there's, uh, there's millions of movie theaters, there's billions of consumers, and um, they, they need to help build a Chinese film industry. So Hollywood in return for opening up for their products are training and helping the Chinese film business. And of course, companies like Alibaba, Tencent, QQ, obviously have had a significant impact where you're seeing greater receptivity amongst Chinese consumers for music from across Asia. If you look at uh, some of the developments, for example, even here in Singapore, a, a great mentoring session taking place this coming weekend, 
And in fact, uh, the well-known record producer, Steve Lillywhite, that produced a number of the U2 albums, actually was in China last year, just after Music Matters, to go and work with some Chinese acts. So this is all positive, yeah, grist to the mill. It's all good stuff. Steve Lillywhite just produced the latest Juanes album that'll plug for my friend with Juanes. And he's on, en route to uh, Indonesia to produce an Indonesian album. Yeah, he's a, he's a, a great guy and a, and a really talented producer. Great I producer. think the, o the other interesting thing about yeah, Alibaba and Tencent, you, you mentioned them, is yeah. that they, they have global aspirations. Right. So that's another reason why they're interested in helping us. And I think that if we can really effectively partner with them, because they are Chinese companies, they can help protect our copyrights in China. Where it's very difficult for us as outsiders, we can't fight in the courts, we, ca we can't do that kind of thing. But if we partner up with these businesses, it's in their interest to help build a real ecosystem for music. And Max, uh, just one question about international talent, international acts. We look at someone who's as big as Lady Gaga, just as an example. With all of your expertise, uh, your management background, your creative background, would you recommend to international acts that they take the trouble to maybe record in some of the Asian languages so they can have some kind of colloquial, contextual relevance? Should an, an artist, uh, I noticed for example this week, uh, someone like John Legend is number one in America, if he recorded in Bahasa or if he recorded in, Malay in one of the Malaysian uh, dialects, do you think that's an important thing for international talent to look to? Well, I don't know. I think any any kind of real connection with the local people is a plus. I know that that it can be a good thing. I, I, I think like an artist like Mika, Mika, who speaks incredibly good French, mm. can sing in French and it's entirely believable and therefore he succeeds and he's actually huge in France. In France. And, and in fact, he's very successful uh, here in Asia. But I think, you know, if you sing in crap French, I don't think it's <laughs> quite so good. Right. So I, I'm, I'm not even sure where Bahasa is um, in terms of a language. But, um, but uh, you know, if I think probably to speak in Mandarin and sing in Mandarin badly. That would work. Might, might, might uh, do more harm than good. But, you know, we know that connection because it's so interesting, uh, again, in in Japan recently, listening to local cover versions right. in Japanese of hit songs. I, I just heard a Taylor Swift cover. Right. But it enhances Taylor Swift's reputation rather than the other way around. But if Taylor could actually record something in Japanese herself, who knows? But the point is that those artists from abroad that take the trouble to work the international markets, I know someone that's been a big star at Music Matters before, Jason Mraz, really focused on, with his manager, very strong manager, Bill Silver, working the Asian countries and really trying to understand how to develop that fan connection at a localized level. That's something that Universal always recommends to, to managers and talent. For sure. It's, it isn't rocket science. You need to turn up. And if you turn up, you'll do better. And like Lady Gaga, you mentioned, was incredible how she traveled. I, I remember you know, she, went, she went to South Korea about four times on her first album. Um, and so if you put in the miles, you generally connect easier with the local people. It was always that thing. I remember when I was a, a manager with Camel, you couldn't expect to just turn up and do a show in New York and break America. Right. You needed to play normal Wisconsin. Goose droppings, you know, Idaho. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, Max, this has really been a fascinating view and great to hear your insight into this. Obviously, you... Uh, have a huge business of billions of billions of dollars in revenues, but it looks as though we're seeing more than just the uh, sunshine on the edge of the grey clouds. We're seeing lots of promise, lots of potential. The influence of the YouTube stars that are emerging, a great new reservoir of new talent. So all in all, the future does look bright. You've got to wear shades to make sure that you can really deal with it. A closing comment from you. Yeah, I, th I think uh, I feel amazingly optimistic about the future. I, th I think we've got to be brave in certain places, particularly in Japan. Um, but um, I embrace the future. It's, it's exciting. There's more music than ever, more people enjoying music. Um, and, uh, and I feel we're going to be able to monetize that. But it's a, it's a different way of doing it. Lots and lots and lots of small transactions making up a big pie. 
Well, music has always changed things. You've got a great executive team all around the region. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm response to one of the great executives in the music business, Max Hall. Max. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff.